welcome to another edition of the Idea of Nepal show brought to you by the Kathmandu Post. Today we have as our guest Dr. Bipin Adhikari who is a constitutional uh, expert and he is also the author of Salient Features of the Constitution of Nepal 2015. Uh, today we will discuss the challenges faced by the new constitution, our constitutional history and the evolution of the, of the Nepali constitutional process. Welcome, Dr. Adhikari. Thank you so much. Even as we speak, um, the constitution we currently have, the constitution that is in force right now, is facing multiple challenges. Would you say the constitution of 2015 is in some kind of a threat? No, uh, I don't think. Uh, uh, there is no threat uh, internally or externally. The real issue is uh, its implementation. So uh, its future depends on the level of implementation we can achieve in due course. So if we go steadily, even if it's slow, it doesn't matter. We can still uh, materialize the uh, vision of the new constitution. Yeah, but why, why, why I ask this is because uh, as far as I understand, four of the main features of the constitution that it institutionalizes federalism, republicanism, secularism and inclusion. What we see right now is a, a serious threat to at least two of the tenets of mm -hmm. secularism and federalism. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? That's true. On, as far as the federal system is concerned, uh, we have uh, many problems. And uh, most of these problems initially were teething problems. But now it has gone beyond. We have problems because the central government is not very keen to implement all the tenets of Nepalese federalism. And the bureaucracy, especially the central level bureaucracy, is not very favorable. But despite that, there is internal pressure everywhere. And there is, uh, um, because of the three-tier federal system, even the local governments are very keen to assert their autonomous power. So uh, in, in, despite the fact that the federal government is slow moving, there is uh, internal pressure and there is some development gradually. Uh, most of the political parties, uh, the parties especially uh, who have national you know, status, they are very keen about federal system, at least at the political level. Uh, no matter what the government thinks about it. Secondly, the people also, there are many uh, in the uh, social political sector, they think that this is the destiny of the country. We cannot change it right now. And uh, similarly, because of the seven provinces and 753 local governments, now uh, there are legitimate voices, you know, pressure comes from there. And there are vested interests also. You can see that we had you know, two general elections already. So these elections have already created many vested interests. Constitutional development by evolution is always an easier process because that gives you enough time to think over and also to consult people who have uh, their own reservation on the issue. So if you interact with everybody and uh, then gradually create a space for them and for yourself, that's the most easiest process. Mm -hmm. And this is how the American constitution has evolved. Otherwise, you can imagine how a constitution with seven articles has you know, sustained even the 21st century requirements. Mm -hmm. It's because of the uh, process of evolution through the practice, through the constitutional interpretation, judiciary, the executive branch, as well as the political process. Mm. So constituent assembly, uh, the way we pursued it was very difficult, but finally we have achieved our goal. So I don't think uh, the people of Nepal, especially politicians of this generation, would do anything to get away with it. So. There are um, the, uh, we have the history of uh, many written constitutions and when these uh, constitutions were dispensed with, the reason behind was geopolitical, 
more than the local politics. So you politics. mean every time we, uh, the previous six constitutions were abandoned, the, the reasons were more geopolitical than domestic? Yes, uh, this, is, this is very true. And in fact, uh, we can... Can you give us some examples to substantiate that? For example, we can take the uh, constitution of 1990. It was a democratic constitution. There was no reason to dismantle the constitutional system. And the Maoist movement that, you know, intervened in the process certainly did a great disservice to the nation when it started the armed, you know, insurrection against the constitution. They said the parliamentary system is not worthy of attention. It must go. And, you know, after so many years... How is that ge geopolitics? Geopolitics, I think, it's the geopolitics that really gave birth to the Maoist movement mm. and all forces associated with it. Mm. So, uh, because the change was, you know, <coughs> the change uh, that the country wanted was certainly uh, the implementation of the constitution. And instead of implementing the constitution, the, uh, the movement, you know, started dismantling it. Mm. So that process, you know, came to end only in 2015. You can see how, you know, the process of dismantling the constitutional system started in 1996. And for another 19 years, it was, uh, you know, a very uh, difficult uh, period of Nepal's history. Okay, I think we are slightly deviating uh, from the topic. So, so let's get back to the constitution and its implementation. Uh, in last eight years, uh, how would, what would your report card of the constitution's implementation would be? Where has the constitution been implemented well and what parts of it have been neglected or its spirit have been perverted in a way? I think on, on federalization is slow but it is moving. And there is, as I said, enough internal pressure, so the change will be on the part of the uh, federal you know, side. Uh, similarly, on secularism also, at least the people who thought that it's not their country, it's a Hindu country, I mean, they have some sort of solace now because it's not a Hindu state. The threat is we are being Christianized and uh, you know, due to uh, you know, the uh, fiscal, uh, financial, as well as political reasons. Uh, and that has to be checked. And it's not a problem with the constitution or the legal regime. It's a problem with you know, under implementation of the provisions of our civil laws. Mm -hmm. So that has to be, uh, you know, that is a very important thing to be looked into. Similarly, we have been uh, um, quite, you know, visible in the implementation of uh, inclusion in the country. Now that gradually uh, the benefits of inclusion uh, are being seen, the state is being, uh, you know, uh, uh, being changed through this provision, even though there is also a problem because the pace of development is very slow and uh, the, the uh, different constituencies which want, uh, you know, some change in Nepal uh, in the context of uh, inclusion are still looking forward to see how their, you know, uh, you know context will change. And the slow, slow process is certainly not a good process. Similarly, we uh, have found that there is a change in the law and order situation. So in the backdrop of Maoist insurgency, the peace process, I think what we have achieved now is certainly substantial. So and now the major you know, issue is the issue of corruption. The state machinery is not uh, uh, very reliable as far as you know, the exercise of power is concerned. So uh, the government uh, from cabinet down to the local level, we can see that uh, the uh, financial um, um, resources are being misused and also the abuse of authority has become quite common. The organizations, you know, fourth branch institutions like 
mm. Commission for the Investigation of Abuse, abuse of, of Authority, authority mm. as well as National Human Rights Commission and many identity-based commissions have not been able to mm, deliver because the state is not uh, on their side. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there is a limited budget, the resource uh, constraint is there. But this is not a failure of the constitution itself. It's not a failure of the constitution at all. Mm -hmm. This is, the constitution might suffer and its delivery side might uh, be weaker. By these the, factors? By, I mean, if there is no change in the scenario. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason that, you know, mm -hmm. these fourth branch institutions have not been very effective. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they are there, they have been working, and there is also the possibility for change. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there is a change in the political elite in the country. Mm -hmm. But you don't see any possibility of a radical change in the constitution or the replacements of this constitution. I ask this because even right now, there are big constituencies that are not happy with the federal system, especially where uh, the provinces are functioning. There is a big section that is not happy with the current sec uh, the secular status in the country. And added to it all, there seems to be a mass discontent mm -hmm. among the people. Yeah. So, uh, so in this climate also, you are saying this constitution is strong enough to withstand all these forces. Mm -hmm. This is, I am saying it because uh, for the change, uh, simple, you know, grievances, you know, on the part of some people who are not happy with the change, you know, uh, this will not uh, really create a threat to the constitution. Now, the, uh, the discontent about federalism is there, but then it can improve. And if there is a change in the economic plight of the people, certainly this, these discontents will uh, gradually decrease on, you know, the secularism also. If there is a change in the scenario of Christianization, obviously people will not become more hardy, you know, more strong in their perspective of Hinduism. Now that uh, the, we, are, we have become vulnerable because of the changing scenario in, in the neighborhood, because people um, have become more, you know, uh, orthodox, in their Hindu orientation, mm. and that was not the Nepalese, you know, situation before. And hopefully, if we keep our, you know, constitution in right track, will not uh, be affected by it. Mm. But the discontent has to be managed. A discontent, uh, you know, some level of discontent is important because that will create the pressure on the government to go according to the rule of law. Uh, to um, pursue the constitutional interest mm -hmm. and the constitutional priority. Yeah, and, and, and in the constitutional context, is our constitution flexible enough to manage those discontent without uh, without crumbling? I think the constitution uh, constitution is flexible. You know, but like uh, if there is, for example, if there is a change in the balance of power uh, within uh, the country. Uh, it is possible that uh, the constitution uh, could be uh, amended. But the scenario is nobody can really think of amending the constitution mm -hmm. because for that you need some sort of stability. Mm -hmm. You need at least one political party which has a majority in the House of Representatives. This is not the scenario at all. So, uh, you know, amending the constitution is something that's a very remote possibility. And uh, for it, is, it has always been possible um, to amend the constitution or change the constitution when there are geopolitical forces um, and it wants a change. And that has happened in Nepal. So, but I don't think there can be any better situation for any geopolitical force in Nepal than where we are now. I mean, uh, this is because... So they are happy with our constitution right now? Obviously, they are happy because they are free. They are doing anything they want. This is a you know, government which has no resistance. And the, we have a parliament which is completely you know, uh, disabled as a forum of people because what it is doing is obviously, you know, uh, giving a go-ahead 
to the government on all parliamentary legislation and the debate in the parliament has not you know uh, any uh, in any meaningful sense you know check the government's exercise of power i mean in important matters i mean so uh, what else a uh, geopolitical element would still like to have in nepal so but from what you are saying then whatever constitution we have uh, is irrelevant because ultimately it's the actors who who decide its fate so so how does the constitution so come if, into play then if there is a one party government and there is you know a, a legitimate process followed in the formation of government obviously there will be a change and now this government i mean is always worried about its existence because it does not have enough backup in the house of representatives so i mean it is obviously a weak government is a government which can always try to compromise whether whether it is whether the problem is with local interest or external mm. so that is the uh, situation now but let's say let's say, uh, assume a situation that there is a one party government and uh, the government uh, you know is led by uh, the progressive elements obviously it will serve all constituencies and uh, also defend the national interest mm -hmm. uh, the people will come in the center of you know power sharing which has not been the case now mm -hmm. you can see nepali congress is the largest party in the house of representatives and it is happy with the leadership of a party which has a third position in the house so why does it accept it i mean had i been for example a politician i would have thought that okay coalition is necessary because of the nature of mandate in the house but we will lead the show because we are the largest party mm. the why nepali congress is not saying and instead is paying off to maoist for something about which we are not very clear of mm. so this is the change okay. and that has affected our you know capacity to govern as well as bring changes mm. so uh, it's a very broad topic we are discussing the constitution uh one of the interesting things i keep hearing about and uh, it's discussed a lot is this uh, the constitution says we are a socialism socialism oriented country as a constitutional uh, lawyer how would how did that uh, how do you think that uh, terminology into the constitution and what does it really mean socialism on its own is a very uh, you know a political term and in fact uh, we should have been able to avoid it Uh, in the constitution now that it is a part of it and uh, in fact it is uh, it has a you know rightful space uh, in the preamble of the constitution so but then the prime preamble also talks about different things and uh, the socialism in nepal means socialism in the democratic sense where you have you know the liberal values protected there is a multi party system there is you know uh, adult franchise you know uh, the uh, uh, right to property is protected the fundamental freedoms have been honored and so socialism is not just about you know the uh, distribution of the national wealth it's also about the commitment to defend you know the uh, liberal values and a democratic system in the country so uh, that's the reason that you know, they there is the constitution also has a long list of you know state obligations directive principles public uh, and you know, the state policies as well so they give a very clear picture of the economic system that we are going to create under the constitution mm -hmm. and it is obviously a mixed system Mm. where socialism only means you know the greatest happiness of the greatest number and protection of the impoverished people including those marginalized and also the indigenous people seeking you know power sharing within the political system so if we take all these things together i mean the constitution would have done 
even without the use of the word socialism. So Nepali Congress at that time, it thought that socialism is a political capital for it. And for the Maoist and UML, I mean, it was something that was closer to their you know, political rhetorics. So that came as a meeting point, although many of us were very clear even at that point that the constitution should not uh, you know, mention about anything, write any such word which does not have strongly legal orientation. But then the constitution you know, was written by more by politicians than lawyers. Mm. So we have many such words used in the constitution which uh, clearly have you know, political overtones and uh, if the court the Supreme Court does not exercise self-restraint, these terminologies might, you know, uh, affect the gravity of the constitution mm -hmm. on the, you know, legal constitutional side. Mm. In terms of, let's uh, uh, compare our constitution to uh, at least countries in the region, say, how, how, how do legal scholars, constitutional experts like you compare constitutions to say, for instance, Nepali constitution is better than the Indian constitution or Pakistani constitution? Uh, let's talk in the South Asian context. Mm -hmm. I think it's not, it will not be, uh, you know, uh, like correct to say that uh, we have a better constitution. Uh, what we can say that, uh, you know, the, the constitution of Nepal at the moment, it meets the requirements of Nepali people. So there were different stakeholders in the constitution making process, and everybody wanted, you know, uh, something that they aspired for. But it's a compromised document, and we have been able to move with it. So this is fine for Nepal. <coughs> Obviously, in terms of certain principles, it is certainly um, ahead of some of our neighbors. Uh, for example, uh, if you take India or our neighboring China, they don't have a concept of proportional inclusion as a mm. constitutional principle. We have that particular concept um, in the constitution as a fundamental right. So this constitution very clearly says that the, uh, the, uh, every community in the country has the right to proportional representation in the state structures. That's a very loud claim, and for which we have to spend a couple of years more to really materialize uh, this provision. But this provision does not exist in India, mm -hmm. uh, in China, even in the United States or UK. It's a noble you know, provision, and uh, it's a homegrown provision, because we didn't uh, want to rely uh, on uh, the concept of affirmative action too much because that was something on the docket of the government. But if there is a right to proportional inclusion, it's not just uh, affirmative action. Uh, apart from affirmative action, it, it creates a scenario where a community, where a citizen of Nepal can go to the court and assert its right to proportional inclusion when there is none uh, in the given context. So that's very empowering. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have identity-based commissions, which is also something that comes as a new feature. Uh, we have the parliamentary system, which has certain uh, uh, clear you know, deviation uh, from the British standards now. Mm -hmm. And that's, that has been created, that provision has been created because we wanted Nepal to see as a stable political system within parliamentary democracy. Uh, Maoists were very keen to move away from this system. And uh, we were, you know, many of us were very keen to continue with the parliamentary system because it is, you know, it gives spaces for the, the diversity and uh, inclusion within the country mm -hmm. and also when there is a flexibility in the uh, you know formation of government and uh, when it is under the control of the house of representatives i mean no state no government can be di can be can remain a dictator mm -hmm. so in a presidential system we have a very different uh, you know context and uh, it's possible that uh, the uh, liberal space that the constitution has created 
might be the victim of a, of a dictator who has been duly elected. So these are, you know, the, uh, the choices based on the desire of the people. Mm -hmm. So Indian constitution, for example, is a great constitution. Uh, now it's coming under the influence of religion and the liberal, you know, space, you know, uh, is shrinking in India. The Chinese constitution, um, very socialist, but then the policy, political space is always, uh, you know, um, under pressure uh, in China um, because there is a one-party government and even though recently they have created some smaller parties as well, I mean, the uh, power lies with the Communist Party of mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the political system has suffered because of the single party, you know, uh, uh, dictatorship, as they say, you know, within the yeah. communist, uh, you know. Uh, so, so, according to you, this is a flexible constitution. This constitution has many unique aspects. Uh, what do you think is its biggest weakness? Uh, what and what, if you could change one provision in this constitution, uh, the constitution of 2015, what would it be? I think the biggest, uh, 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 the vulnerability of the constitution has many, let me put it. Uh, it's only that I don't think these vulnerabilities will immediately create any threat. The, for example, we have a proportional election system. And then when you go through proportional election system, the politics based on ideology has a very limited space. Uh, people have a tendency, especially in a country like ours, where the mass is not educated, you know, there, the, there is immense poverty within the country, and also the uh, alternatives before the people are not quite, you know, open. The uh, uh, proportional representation will, you know, will uh, impact uh, the way we cast our vote. It's not based on ideology. We have a tendency to see whether one, the uh, ethnicity, for example, religion, uh, as another example. Similarly, regionalism is also there, language, culture, and you know, these things influence the voting behavior. So the candidates represent their constituency and not the political space, the ideology, um, which they think is good for the country uh, by way of a governing principle. So that um, problem is there. Similarly, we- So you are in favor of more direct uh, uh, seats uh, in elections? It is, I mean, we can, you know, we can uh, look forward to a few uh, more general elections and determine what is good for us. But, but this, we should not, you know, just see the constitution, give it more importance than our political behavior. So it is possible that we improve in due course. But if we don't, probably we can, uh, uh, we can ma make sure that the uh, first uh, past the post system uh, addresses the concerns of ethnic people or these diversities in our uh, you know communities uh, with a system which is which remains uh, FITP but then there is inbuilt strength to give you know space to these communities at least there is no change uh, in the uh, in the present outcome of the political process so if we do that, probably we'll get more, you know, ideology-based uh, people, you know, uh, in the political system. Mm -hmm. So this is a remote possibility. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have uh, the, if this federal system um, is successful to, uh, well, to maximize our wealth, I mean, uh, to, in terms of economic prosperity, if there is some discernible gains obviously uh, the system will gradually become stable and then there will be self-government autonomy you know and uh, the uh, present challenges or of uh, instability will gradually you know it will uh, slow down so that's uh, one you know possibility 
the uh, the other challenge i see is the mediocrity of the political uh, people uh, the, unfortunately we had you know the if you go by the past standards this country had very educated enlightened leadership in the past for example bp koirala uh, matrika babu was there uh, you know uh, subarna samser was there ganesh man singh was there now gradually uh, the, the political elite in the country have become uh, a mediocre lot um, and uh, this is clearly in the local government as well as in the provincial uh, or in the national scenario so that um, has to change i mean uh, more people especially uh, the nepali people living abroad you know the nrn they should be able to return you know join the politics here and change the political scenario when there are more educated people our you know the democratic system can be a boon now that democracy has become it has given a freedom together with the uh, the possibility of corruption to the people who want to you know make their fortune from this political system the right people are not coming you can see in nepali congress for example even though it's a democratic party the newcomers you don't when you see the faces of the newcomers you get disappointed because they are not the locally locally uh, you know proven uh, social you know activist i mean there are people you know who come from economic you know sector the uh, traders for example you know similarly there are the local you know guns are there you know and this is the situation in uml also in other parties also the right thing people they don't want to join politics because they think that they cannot sustain it they don't have money and the election commission has not been able to create enough pressure on the political elite to change the law in the country to make sure that uh, simple social activist can join the politics you can see the big businesses are having their presence in the parliament in the local governments in the uh, uh, provincial governments so these things uh, give us a very uh, bleak scenario because politics is a different space and uh, there is a certain level of public accountability if there is none then people should not join politics and politics should not be simply joined because Uh, uh, there is a possibility for abuse of power and earning you know uh, money in a way which is not otherwise possible so these are the uh, you know uh, vulnerabilities uh, we were talking about the vulnerabilities one of the hotly debated uh, issues immediately after the prolongation uh, promulgation of the constitution was this uh, discrimination in the granting of citizenship uh, to uh, say it, it was difficult for women to transfer uh, their citizenship to their children you know now it's uh, it, it, there is no provision of uh, lgbtiq for instance you know so i mean the constitution cannot include everything but where these major uh, mistakes in the constitution making process i think the citizens uh, citizenship provisions are you know uh mm, very good i think uh, uh in the perspective of people who want to be nepali uh obviously it's relaxed now and uh, the uh, uh, laws have been you know uh, changed to make sure that the constitution is implemented the uh, our problem is uh, a country cannot just you know sustain by you know inviting foreign populations i mean there were certain discriminations uh, to the you know lineage from uh, from the data side for example that has been uh, uh, resolved right from uh, ma- i mean daughters married to foreigners mm. so now that's no longer an issue and uh, the other you know smaller issues even if they are i mean they are they will not be stuck because there is a parliament and the constitution is quite open now we have to be concerned about the the immigrant population i mean how can you sustain a country 
when you allow through the open border, you know, every year thousands of people, you know, uh, to settle in Nepal, give them all opportunities that Nepalis have, and then gradually establish them in trade and, you know, industries, and because of their, you know, money power, offer citizenship. And this way, we, our own people, you know, will be um, the, you know, uh, not the decisive factor in the uh, elections, in the political process, because the power always, go, you know, in most of the cases, uh, align with the, uh, you know, the property, you know, align with the trade, with industries, and the poor Nepalese options will obviously be affected. But isn't that also a reflection of how open or close we want to be as a country to foreigners, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. do, uh, do we want to just limit this country for, uh, for a particular section of people, or do we want to now, be open to the world? I think the challenge for us now is of Indianization. I mean, nobody is saying that Nepal has become a, um, a home for many Americans, many Russians or many Europeans. No. The, even if these, uh, you know, people are here, I mean, they are not in substantial, you know, number, and they do not affect the local processes. With the Indian people coming here, everything is being affected. You see, now that uh, I give you an example, you go to Paspatinath, now around Paspatinath, in Paspatinath, Nepalese people are, you know, a minority. You go to the shops there, they are owned by Indian immigrants. You go to the barbers there, you go to the, you know, and the Nepali you will find there, you know, selling flowers, you know, so they, with a hot cup of, you know, tea or coffee selling around. But, you know, all institutional arrangements there, I mean, except that the, the government exists, but not the people. And it's a change that has been brought since the last 15 years. I mean, this way, you know, can we accept uh, this change as something in the interest of Nepal? This is our issue. I mean, we should be quite open and in fact... Is this a debate, is this in a way a debate between, say, nationalism, as some people define it, and people's individual rights? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, what you're saying is that... Uh, we don't want, look... We don't want the change in uh, the, uh, uh, the composition of population in Nepal. Uh, that's uh, uh, for sure. And that's very important for us. Similarly, we don't want um, uh, Nepal to be Indianized. That's another issue for us. Uh, thirdly, we don't want Nepal's you know, poor and impoverished people to, you know, stay, to continue to lag behind because all the opportunities in the countries have been taken over by outsiders. On the, on the name of you know, close relations with any particular country, we don't want to you know, create a scenario where Nepalis lose their identity. You see, it's a country with more than 130 ethnic groups. You can see there are different languages, different cultures, and when it is gradually taken over, by one dominant culture, you know, that too, you know, uh, from, you know, the other, from another country, is certainly, you know, we'll be losing our context. And that should not be the case. Okay. Now, you see how Hindu religion, the impact, you know, we are Hindus by all the standards. Uh, more, I mean, if you go by uh, our founder, uh, uh, Prithvi Nayan Sah, he said that, you know, that I observed and try to learn from you know my own country. It happens to be a real Hindustana, you know, because the Hindustana on the other side of the border has already become a Mughlana. You know, it doesn't have the virtues of a better Hindu system. Now that that was a history in the past. Now it is being aggressive. So, in a small country like Nepal, you see, if we become aggressive in terms of Hindu religion, our smaller, you know, subcultures will be affected. Mm -hmm. Obviously, our value system have been, you know, it has been uh, created uh, through the investment of centuries 
of Nepaliness. And now, at once, if we do something that will minimize our own communities, we will create a scenario, a fear psychosis that, okay, this country does not belong to us okay. anymore okay. because now the, uh, even our national, nationalist you know, orientation is also being affected because of the pressure from outside. Certainly, mm -hmm. it is something um, that comes as a genuine concern for yeah. us. So constitution is a, uh, is a very vast subject again, and we could go on and on, but uh, uh, I'd like to ask just a few more questions before we close. Uh, uh, one thing is, uh, talking about our constitutional history, uh, like we have had sev seven constitutions, and over the years, my uh, limited reading suggests that uh, we have moved from more earlier constitutions used to emphasize the duties of the citizens, now it's more leaning towards the rights, right? They are mm -hmm. our rights rather than our duties. So uh, in this long evolution of Nepal's constitutional process, uh, are we happy with this evolution? Or are you also, do you also think that we have regressed in certain ways in the making of constitution? Some, power, some of our earlier constitutions were better than this. Uh, what is your reading on that? The current situation about the fundamental rights of the Nepalese citizen is slightly different. Now you have many uh, economic, social, and cultural rights guaranteed by the constitution. And these guarantee of these rights, even on paper, you know, uh, means a lot. Now that the, uh, the, the, uh, the situation is like, uh, like this, we have many rights, there is inflation in the rights, because the capacity of the state to, you know, fulfill uh, the obligation is very, uh, very, um, you know, limited. Now that the constitution says we have right to employment, but the state is not the producer of jobs in the country because we rely on the private sector for this particular, you know, uh, uh, particular obligation. So similarly, we have, you know, many, uh, uh, the labor rights are there, the rights, you know, the educational rights are there, and the uh, rights of, you know, uh, the uh, elderly people is also there. So they create a lot of, you know, uh, pressure on the state resources. And uh, the, when the parliament uh, created implementing laws, it tried to define it in a way that, you know, uh, Mm, that is uh, some way uh, makes it possible to implement these rights. But then, you know, parliament limiting the fundamental rights is something that's very objectionable. I mean, uh, when we say a particular right is fundamental, I mean, conventionally we mean that if that right has been violated, you can go to the Supreme Court immediately and uh, then um, file a writ petition and as soon as the court finds that there is a prima facie case, it will issue uh, an order to protect that right. Now the scenario is the Supreme Court will have to open the law book mm. and find how the constitutional right has been elaborated or narrowed down by a particular act of parliament. Mm. So that means that fundamental rights are fundamental in a way the, that the parliament wants. So that's certainly a, a big issue that even during the constitution making, we were very keen not to write something in the constitution that the state cannot quickly afford. But then because of the pressure of the, you know, the marginalized and deprived you know, uh, communities within the house, uh, we had to accept it. And then we said the same thing that, okay, Let's say right to health is there. Probably the, the, it's not possible even for the United States or for a, you know a European country to ensure the right to health the way we formulated it. We were very keen that let's limit this right to health to particular type of disease, to particular type of institutional you know interventions and a particular, you know, case of emergencies or, you know, the um, protection in the um, rights context. But then 
that was not acceptable. They said, no, that's the very elitist you know, point of view. We, have, we need to have all these things written in the constitution. So obviously they have written, now they are in power, they are in the parliament, now they feel that the story um, has not you know, developed in a way they wanted it to be. Because, I mean, they left the political space open for the government as well as parliament, but then the constitutional values were in some way affected. Now that we cannot, you know, just go to the Supreme Court and say that, okay, my right to health has been affected, please issue now a mandamus to, you know, uh, immediately implement my right. So that scenario is complicated now. Yeah, so we have had a long discussion. In the end, uh, are there particular resources, uh, uh, books or uh, research papers that will help us better understand? Can you enlist two or three uh, of those things that will help us better understand Nepal's constitutional history? You yourself have uh, written a very good book, which is called Salient Features of the Constitution of 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, Salient Features of the Constitution of Nepal 2015, sorry. Yes. So besides that, are there any other resources that uh, someone interested would like to look into? In fact, we have very limited, uh, you know, uh, resources on the Constitution of Nepal. Apart from that book, you know, I also edited a conference, you know, uh, uh, proceedings uh, of a conference that we organized in 2018. So it is the, the uh, Treaties on the Constitution of Nepal, 2015. That's a collection of articles, very well edited, but uh, that uh, uh, discusses many constitutional problems in Nepal and uh, uh, particularly the implementation issues over the you know first five years. Okay, uh, it was a very enlightening interview. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Dr. you so much. Thank you.